In 1953, the head of physics at the University of Sydney, Harry Messel, decided that he wanted his own computer for his department. The CSIR Mark I was still on campus but was not available to them, so drawing on his very considerable charm and flamboyance, he convinced the university to back him in his quest. He was then able to secure a generous donation from a prominent Sydney jeweller called Adolf Basser. Basser donated the winnings from one of his horses that won the Melbourne Cup to ensure that the Basser Department of Computer Science could be established. Operational in June 1956, Filiac ran the first computer payroll system for the then Postmaster General's Department and was used on many other problems across a range of industries until its demise in 1968. Yeah, Sildiac was a copy of Iliac, which was built by the University of Illinois, built at Sydney University. Harry Messel got a professor of physics named John Blatt. John Blatt was originally at the University of Illinois, so together they were very fond of that computer over there. It was to be called the Sydney Iliac or Siliac, and they provided the circuits to Messel and Blatt. The biggest change they made from Iliac was to go to a different valve, which had a longer lifetime and a longer mean time to failure, which, which greatly improved the reliability of Ciliac. That was built entirely in Australia at Standard Telephones and Cables, STC. Companies like STC were chosen because of their competence with building electronic devices. The only difference really between Ciliac and CIRAC is that Ciliac was a parallel machine. That would give it a distinct speed advantage over computers of the day that operated in serial mode. CIRAC used acoustic delay lines for its memory. Ciliac used williams kilburn tubes for its memory. Ciliac then was able to work considerably faster than CIRAC. It could do more work and it started to do all kinds of interesting physics and things like that. One of the big advantages of going to Iliac was to use the libraries. So they could get hold of their software and use libraries because the programming is the same. Around 56, mid-56, Ciliac was about, was ready to be run. John Bennett was a professor of computing science at Sydney University. He had trained with Morris Wilkes at Cambridge. He was brought out here, he was an Australian, he'd gone over there after studying what was known as electrotechnology at the University of Sydney, and then went to Cambridge, did a PhD with Morris Wilkes, and then was lured back by Messel to take over the department. He arrived in the beginning of 56 and got the department going. He was a what was known as a numerical analyst. In other words, he was the man who would take the ideas, I want to do this and this and this mathematically, and turn them into algorithms. So he was essentially Ciliac's first programmer. So in the 1950s, most computer usage was done by government agencies, in particular academia. The physics department was very big in computing in order to do find quarks and, and measure, you know, fundamental particles. Blatt and his team ran a piece of program that they had developed, but basically it was about how neutrons and protons and electrons rotated around each other and, and stayed together and stuff. First run of the program, they had to debug it. They fixed that overnight. They ran it again the next morning and they had breaking news, world leading piece of result which then made them very famous for the next 15 minutes. The reason for going for something like Ciliac was to do some computations far faster than people could. I was interested in the possibility of doing something with computers and at Sydney University, where the Ciliac machine was, I went and did some uh, courses that during the holidays that, to be introduced to computer programming. Well, it was uh, in a, a substantial room, probably about eight to 10 metres long, and the computer filled about uh, seven or eight 19-inch racks. It was a valve machine, several racks of valves. The main reliability problem, of course, was the valves themselves. They, they would fail, they had to be replaced, but it ran most of the time. 
and the people there were able to maintain it. There were valves everywhere. You could walk around behind it and you know, around the front panels, etc. because there's lot, there lots of lights blinking and various things like that that I recall, and some machine chattering away down at the end of the room. It was quite astounding to, to see it. And you could see people running around in lab coats, but it seemed to be an environment that you, uh, you, were, you were kept away from. They had a computer operator, somebody who sat in front of them. There were a few levers there. There was a few levers that you set up to, uh, to, to start it all off, which loaded the first two instructions into a register, and then you push the button and sort of it, uh, those two instructions executed and read in the next next two instructions off the paper tape and then those would read more and then be a self-replicating thing so you'd get the whole tape coming in but it all started off with this uh, initial program load it's called these days is how you start it but there are only two or three switches on the front there as a programmer i sat down and on a teletop machine punched out all this paper tape which had all these uh, assembly instructions you put it into a paper tape reader and, it, and then when you switched it on then said it would start reading this paper tape really very very fast at least it looked awfully fast because the ejector of the tape reader used to shoot the tape out about two meters before it finally dropped into a bin but in the later days they installed a punch card reader what's more if you had a program on punch cards if there's a mistake in the program you could just fix it on one card you didn't have to replicate <laughs> you know, two kilometres of tape. Yes, I remember Celiac. It was a, a batch machine and you would submit your job to be run and get the results back maybe a few hours or a day later. I had a, an unhappy relationship with the Celiac because it was a punch card system where you submitted a box of cards to the reception desk and it was processed and then two days later you'd get a uh, report back on how your program went. And I dropped the box of cards on the way to the uh, reception. They all got shuffled. So the order of the instructions in the program obviously would have been messed up. And I spent the rest of the course basically resubmitting this thing, getting errors out of it. I, I remember someone giving a lecture one day and they, they had a stack of cards that was a program. And, and in the lecture he said, I have here a program. And as he lifted up his hand, he dropped the whole lot of cards and they spread all over the floor. Well, I don't know how he ever sorted them out again. What I can remember is in the dungeon where the punch card machines were, that was like a, a deafening sort of place to be working in for any length of time. You know, you'd get very tired trying to think in, a, in an environment like that. What I would have liked to have done with the Ciliac would be to, to go and do a uh, computer programming thing where the result was I'd hear something. They started to do industrial work with it, for example, load shedding, under, getting the loads balancing for the uh, electrical supply system was one of the major jobs they did. It They did a hell of a lot of work on the Snowy Mountains Authority design. It fairly accurately simulated the, the functions of the Snowcom computer, and so it was possible to develop the programs for Snowcom using that simulator. The hardware followed later. Bob would periodically come across and test a program if we had it running uh, on, uh, on Snowcom, on the real hardware. So all of that kind of calculation work was done. It was then started to do radio astronomy. Silac was definitely useful. It was used for some, some great work. Certainly it did indeed solve a lot of other complex problems which would have taken many, many hours of, of hand computation otherwise. It had a Fortran compiler. That in itself made it very useful. Certainly I think we can be proud that here in Sydney we had one of the world's first useful, productive, working automatic computers. When Ciliac was decommissioned in 68, all the students wrote little musical pieces for Ciliac. Uh, which, which, which included the funeral march and it was actually, that was its last action was to play its own funeral march before they switched it off. <laughs>